Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay. Good to see everybody again today, and for those of you joining us out on television, this is another afternoon of taping four programs, and I uh, always like to remind our viewing audience that uh, for four weeks you're going to see everybody sitting in the same place. It isn't that they're that uh, meticulous about where they sit, but uh, we do tape four programs in an afternoon, and if you're ever in the Tulsa area, for goodness sakes, call us and be a part of our taping of these programs. We meet the first Wednesday of the first week of every month. Not the first Wednesday, there is only one. But uh, the Wednesday of the first week of every month, and uh, if you're going to be in this area that time, why, you just give us a call, and we'd love to have you come in and be a part of this. And again, we always like to remind our viewing audience that all the past programs are available on videotape, audio tapes, and the printed page. And uh, we've kept the cost as nominal as we can so that anyone can afford them. So if you're interested in any of that, you just give us a call or drop us a note and uh, we'll send the information out to you. Our Bible study, that's the only reason we're here, and uh, our whole scope of teaching is to simply help people to study on their own, be able to read and understand what the Bible is all about. So we are currently, of course, in Paul's epistles, and we're now in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, in our last program, we left off down there at verse 9, where Paul has just been dealing with the fact that as soon as a believer dies, and I've had that question come in so often, the moment, the second that a believer passes off the scene and their soul and spirit leaves the body, it goes immediately into the presence of the Lord. Now, what their activity is and what their state is uh, at this point in time, I'm in no position to say because the Bible is fairly silent. All we know is that they are in the Lord's presence and they're waiting for the great resurrection day, which, of course, we studied several weeks ago when we were in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, of course, the only thing I can do to temper our, our thinking on this is that in eternity there is no time and so even though Adam has been dead 6,000 years, when the resurrection day comes, he won't suddenly realize that he's been off the scene that long, but it'll be just as if it's happened within a matter of hours because time is irrelevant. And so always keep that in mind that when our departed loved ones will be reunited with us, it isn't that they're going to suddenly realize what a long time it's been. Uh, I think one writer put it this way, and I may have shared it on the program before, it's just like if you take one of your loved ones to the train depot, that was back, of course, when trains were in vogue, and if you took someone to the train and they got on one of the front cars and uh, got them all situated, but ere the train pulled out of the station, you decided to quickly go buy a ticket and you get on one of the cars at the end of the train. Well, uh, without one knowing it from the other, you're both going to arrive at the same destination at the same time. And uh, that may be a crude way of putting it, but I think that's what it's going to be. Even though our loved ones have left maybe years ago, and then suddenly when the resurrection day comes or the rapture as we're looking forward to it, and we meet our loved ones, it won't be like, well, I haven't seen you in 20, 30, 40 years. It's going to be like we just saw them five minutes ago. And so all these things enter into these uh, events that are going to happen. And so I think a lot of times we we probably make it more difficult than it really is. But anyway, Paul has now been dealing with the departure of the soul and spirit from the body, which puts us, of course, present with the Lord. And then in verse 9, where we ended in our last program, he says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, that's beside the point, that's moot, whether we're still here on this world or whether we've gone on to be with the Lord, whether we're present or absent, we may be approved is a better word, I think, than accepted because we're not dealing with salvation here at all. And this is the whole thing that I want to emphasize in this next few moments is that in these verses dealing with believers, 
between, I almost say from verse 1 until verse 13, he is not dealing with salvation whatsoever. It is totally in the area of reward for our living here in this life as believers. And of course, that's the admonition then to, to a believer, is that we're not just saved to escape hellfire. We are saved to serve. And that's why he leaves us here. In fact, as I was driving up just a moment ago, I couldn't help but think of even the 12. Come back all the way into Christ's earthly ministry. And that would have to be back in Matthew 19. Come all the way back. And we touched on this, of course, when uh, we were, I suppose, back in the book of Acts or someplace. But uh, anyway, as we come up through the scriptures, we repeat, and I know we repeat, but I keep getting letters all the time, almost every day. Somebody said, don't ever apologize for repeating, because that's the way we learn. But here in Matthew 19, you remember, the 12 have been with Jesus now for almost the whole three years. They have their salvation. They're not talking about that whatsoever. That is, the leaven do. We're not counting Judas. But in verse 27 of Matthew 19, Matthew 19, verse 27, Peter answered and said unto Jesus, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Well, what's he referring to? Well, what kind of a, a reward are we going to get for having left all of our material blessings and things, his fishing and his business and their home and their family? What are we going to have? Now, they're not talking about salvation. They're talking about reward, see? And look how evident it is in the next verse. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you who have followed me, beginning from up there at the fishing boats in Galilee, those of you who have followed me in the regeneration, that is, when the kingdom would be set up, and the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging or ruling the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, what was that? That's their reward for having served him so diligently during those three years of his earthly ministry. It had nothing to do with their salvation, but it had everything to do with what are they going to have for it all, see? All right, now if you'll come back with me then to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we've got the same concept now for you and I as members of the body of Christ. Paul's not dealing with our salvation. He is dealing with reward. All right, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, then verse 10. For Paul writes, we must, what's the next word? All. No one is going to escape it. Nobody is going to fast talk the Lord out of this situation. Everybody is going to have to meet him at the judgment seat. Now, I'm, I'm often wish that the King James translators wouldn't have used the word judgment. I think it scares people. But the Greek word is bima. And we must all appear before the bima seat. And in the Greek, that's what it is. It's bima. And we, most of you, I think, know we touched on it in our last program. The bema was usually just a raised platform. If you go to the ruins of Corinth, that's one of the tourist attractions. You go to the bema there in ancient Corinth. And all it was was just a raised platform, not much higher than the one I'm using. And the party to be judged, of course, would stand in front of the judges who were on the bema seat. But it was also used in the Olympic Games for the seat of the judges who would determine who came in first, second, third, and so forth. And so this is the analogy that I think Paul is more apt to have in mind is the Olympics rather than the political situation at the uh, Bema seat of government. And so, looking at it from an Olympic sports event scenario, we must all appear before the Bema seat not to be judged for our sin. Oh, listen, I can't stress that enough because you have no idea how many people over the year have said, well, Les, am I going through all these trials and tribulations because of sin in my past? Well, you know, the first thing I ask them, are you a believer? Are you a child of God? Oh, yeah, I know I'm saved. Well, then where do you get this idea you still have sin on your back? Well, I don't know. Well, I don't either because it's not in this book. You do not carry past sins because they have been judged at the cross. 
Now let's look at a few verses. Lest somebody say, well, where do you get these things? And I can see where many people are probably saying that. Turn over to the right a few pages to Ephesians. Ephesians. Chapter 3. Maybe it's 4. Uh-oh. Uh oh, I always knew I'd get into this someday. Yeah, chapter 4, verse 32. I tell my classes here in Oklahoma every once in a while, you know, someday I'm going to walk into that buzz saw that's just going to almost kill me, and that is turn to a verse and can't find it. But uh, here it is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians 4, verse 32. And be ye kind one to another. Now remember in this book of Ephesians, Paul again is addressing believers but on a higher level than he has even the Corinthians. I remember the, the books of Paul are progressive. We move from the simplistic to the more in-depth and those things that are more doctrinal. All right, so here he says to these believers at Ephesus, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, not so that you can be forgiven. See, that's what the disciples' prayer says back in Matthew. You have to forgive everybody before you can be forgiven. See that difference? Oh, it's a vast difference. But see, that's not what Paul writes. Paul says, be ready to forgive your neighbor because you have already been forgiven. See the concept? All right, read it on. Forgiving one another, even as God, in Christ's sake, has, past tense, what? Forgiven you. Now, that doesn't just take you up to a certain point in time. That means now and forever you're forgiven. Let's carry it a little further to the right. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And my, the scripture doesn't lie. It cannot. And we have to believe it because this is what God is going to hold us accountable for. Do you believe my word? And he calls that faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. See, it all just rolls together. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. Colossians 2, verse 13. And you, Paul writes, being dead in your sins, that is, in our pre-salvation existence, and the uncircumcision of your flesh regarding pagan Gentiles, he... God, of verse 12, He has quickened together with Him. In other words, how have I always put it? When Christ died, we died. When He arose from the dead, we arose to newness of life. All right. And so He hath made us alive together with Him, having what? Forgiven. Now, if I remember my English grammar, that was a past tense participle. But having forgiven you, Part of your trespasses? Most of them? How many? All of them. Every last one that we did commit, are committing, and will commit. They're already forgiven. You know, I stressed, I think, in our last series of four programs a month ago, how that when Christ died, how much of the world's sins did he die for? All of them. He tasted death, Hebrews says, for every man. And I'm going to keep repeating it. I want people to know that if they go out into a lost eternity, it wasn't because their sins weren't taken care of. It won't be because the atoning blood wasn't for them. It's because they rejected it in unbelief, see? And oh, pass this on. Make people realize that their sin debt is paid in full. But God can't activate that payment until they believe the gospel. See, that's the kicker. We have to believe before we can appropriate this forgiveness. But for those of us who believe, yes, we are totally, totally forgiven. All right, let's go across the page in my Bible anyway to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And again, it's that same concept that we are forgiven. We are forgiven, and uh, now here's one I'm not going to find. I guess I got my new Bible, and I had it underlined in my old one, and I'm not going to find it. Isn't that awful? Well, like they always say, those are the things that keep you humble. And uh, 
Well, anyway, verse 13 is almost the same thing of Colossians 3. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. See, and I, I know there's another verse in here that says just exactly like chapter 2 said, that we are forgiven all of our sins and our trespasses. And so now if you'll come back with me then to chapter 5, when we come before the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ, it isn't that we're going to have to face our sin because they are taken care of. They're forgiven. They're canceled. So we come before him now to be judged, if you want to use that word, for what we have done as believers in our earthly sojourn. And this is where it's all going to come together. And it's not going to be so much on how much we have done as the motivation behind what we have done. Why do we do the things that we do? In other words, if the only reason I taught was to show people what I know, hey, it would count for nothing. It has to be the right motive. And so everything we do has to be done in that light that um, am I doing it because I love the Lord? Am I doing it that he'll receive the glory? Then it'll count for reward. If we're doing it to show people how much we can accomplish, it'll count for nothing. It'll be nothing more than wood, hay, and stubble. All right, reading on in verse 10 again of 2 Corinthians 5. For we must all appear before the beam of seat of Christ that everyone, that is every believer, there will be no unbelievers at this judgment seat. This is only for believers, that everyone may receive the thing done in his body. See, while we're here, according to that that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, and then knowing, therefore, the terror or the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. All right, so this whole concept of working for reward, we're going to just spend this half hour in it. And I'd like to have you come back with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We covered it quite in depth several months ago, but let's look at it again. That's the same idea. <clears throat> the same idea that he has here in 2 Corinthians 5. Now 1 Corinthians chapter 3 beginning with verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. All with me? Now if any man... See, it's the same kind of language. There's nobody left out. There's no exclusions. So if any believer builds upon this foundation, which, of course, up in verse 11 is Jesus Christ, is our Savior and Lord. All right? If any man builds upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, everyone's work shall be made manifest. And usually I always use the word, you know, puts in the spotlight for that word manifest. So every believer's work is going to be put in the spotlight. And the very fiery eyes of the Lord Jesus are going to examine everything that we've done as believers. And we can either have those things that the fire cannot touch, such as the gold, silver, and precious stones, or we'll have some of the stuff that goes up in a puff of smoke, wood, hay, and stubble. All right, so that, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. And that, again, is going to be primarily based on your motive, my motive. Why do we do the things that we categorize as good works? Is it just for pleasing the flesh? Is it to please someone else? Or is it strictly done for God's honor and glory? All right, but now verse 13. Every man's work that he has done as a believer shall be put in the spotlight for the day. What day? That day before the Bema seat. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And I always have to go back to that portion of Scripture in Revelation where the eyes of the Lord Jesus are as what? Fire. Doesn't say they are fire, but they are as fire, and it makes a big difference. And so as he penetrates the works record of every believer, the stuff that was wood, hay, and stubble will just disappear. And that which was gold, silver, and precious stones, that'll remain. And from that, we will receive a reward. All right, now then, verse 14. So if any man's work abide, which 
he hath built thereupon, he shall receive what? A reward. That's what your Bible says. And that's what mine says. And you can't argue with that. Now, I know a lot of people don't like that concept, but I'll never forget. It's quite a few years ago now. I had a dear gentleman in my class who had been pastor of a large church in Chicago. And I know he listens to the program. He'll know who I'm talking about. And he came up one night after I'd been teaching this very thing. And he said, Les, teach it and teach it and teach it. He said, so few people understand this concept of reward for the believer. Absolutely we're going to receive a reward. Above and beyond our salvation, above and beyond the promises. You know, we like to think of the streets paved with gold and the mansions in glory. Well, that, that's not the reward. The reward is going to be something else. And I, I can't totally put my finger on it, but I'd like to think it's going to be places of responsibility in the heavenlies. I just noticed in the Daily Oklahoman this morning that the Hubble Space uh, Telescope people have just found the largest star that has ever been dreamed of. Some heads are nodding. You saw it. Just mind-boggling. We have no idea. If I remember correctly, the analogy was that that star puts out more energy and heat in a few moments than our sun does in a year. It's just beyond comprehension. So whatever, that whole area, I think, of outer space is going to be the domain of the church age believer because we are told that we're going to rule the heavenlies. Israel is going to have the earth. We're, we're, we're going to give them that. But the believers of the church age, the body of Christ, we are going to rule in the heavenlies. Now, I think there's also going to be a certain amount of interfacing between uh, those of us in our resurrected bodies and the millennial citizens who will be in flesh and blood. There, there's going to have to be, I would think. But whatever, there's going to be areas of reward that I want every believer to work for. You don't work for salvation. That is a gift. In fact, let's go back to Romans chapter 6 because this is a concept that is so hard for a lot of people to overcome because they've had it drummed into them since they were little that they have to work. They have to do something for salvation. But Romans chapter 6 verse 23 just literally blows that out of the saddle. Romans 6, verse 23. You all know the verse, I'm sure. For the wages. See, now that's something you earn. The wages of sin is death, spiritual death. Yes, physical, but predominantly spiritual. But the flip side, the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, how much work can you do and still call it a gift? None. See, you can't work for something and then call it a gift. And as soon as you work for it, it's no longer a gift. And so it is with salvation. It has to be something that we take totally as a gift of God without having to do any work of any kind. It's a gift of God. But once we have become recipients of that gift, what does God logically expect? Then now we go to work and work for reward. See, that's the whole idea. That we're not saved to sit, we're saved to serve. And that is going to all be brought about at that Bema seat of Christ when we will be handed out our rewards, which are our areas, I think, of responsibility. Now, another thing I don't want you to confuse rewards with are the crowns. Now, I don't think the crowns have anything to do with the rewards that we receive from the Bema seat. Now, we know there are various crowns listed, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, and so on and so forth. But don't confuse them with rewards. I, I don't think they're one and the same whatsoever. The rewards are those things that we're going to receive as a result of the things that we have done in the body in this earthly sojourn. And, of course, we know from our study back in Romans, when Paul listed the gifted men that he gave to the church, not everybody has that same gift. They're not all going to work in that same area for their reward. But every believer has something. Don't ever lose that. I don't care who you are. I don't care how old you are, how young you are. You have something that God has given you that can be used as a gift 
and it in turn can precipitate your rewards. Now let's come back. We got a moment or two. Let's come back to 1 Corinthians again, chapter 9, where, where Paul see, alludes to this over and over. And this is by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, remember. This isn't just man's idea. This is what God wants us to understand. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now it's been a long time since we were way back there. But uh, beginning at verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 24 where he writes again to Gentile believers. And he says, Know ye not that they who run in a race all run? But one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain, not salvation, but what? The prize. See, the reward. Now verse 25. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, he's alluding to the Olympic athletes. I, I know he is. And so what did the athletes do? They trained, and they trained, and they trained. But they did it with temperance, and they did not destroy their body with overtraining, nor on the other hand did they come flabby and in no condition to run the race. And so with common sense, being temperate in all things, they prepared for these Olympic races. And so Paul is telling us the same thing. Now verse 25, reading on. Now they, the Olympic runners, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. And we all know what that was. It was just a, a wreath of leaves and so forth. And by the time they got home, it was all dried up and good for nothing, but I suppose put between the bookshelves. And so he says, they did it for a corruptible crown. But we, we who are running a race and we're running for reward, we are looking for an incorruptible crown, one that will never end. In other words, once the Lord establishes our place of responsibility in the heavenlies for eternity, hey, that's never going to end. It's going to be ours forever and ever and ever. And oh, like I said, I think in our last program, if only more people could get a concept of eternity. Eternity is without end. And whatever reward we have earned, we are going to enjoy for all eternity. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported and your gift is appreciated. Thank you and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.